Well, hello, writers. Welcome to episode number 359 of How Do You Write? I'm Rachel Heron, and today I am so happy to be here to, with Molly Fader. And we have a fantastic conversation about lots of things on trusting on in breakthroughs and talking to ourselves in a really useful way. But you're going to want to hear this fantastic craft tip on what to do when you are stuck. So please stick around for that. What has been going on around here? Oh my goodness, I am back in session. 90 days to done and 90 day revision started this week. And I am so happy. I'm so happy. I didn't know how much I would miss it this the April really, really threw me for a loop. I didn't know what I was doing. I didn't know whether I was coming or going or what I wanted to work on. And I was missing the structure that teaching gives me. Sometimes I know I need a break. And I really felt like I needed a break at the beginning of April. But by the end of April, I was done with having a break. And I just needed to get back into connection with other writers I have been at Rachel Says Write. I took the whole month of April off of Rachel Says Write and I'm back in there and writing with other people. And it is blowing my mind how much energy that gives me. I am not an extrovert by any means. I am an introvert who can kind of pretend I can act like an extrovert every once in a while. I used to think I was more of an ambivert, ambivert. I can't speak today, but it's become more and more clear over the last three or four years that I am a heavy duty introvert and need to be alone. But as a human being, I need connection. And specifically, I need connection with writers. I don't need connection with randoms because I don't care. Uh, if anybody does Clifton strengths, I have high relator, which means <laughs> I pick the people that I want to spend time with. And um, that is my, that's my heart. That's my, my group. And when it comes to looking out to a wider community, it needs to be people with whom I share something deep and true. And when I am sharing writing with a bunch of people, it is the best feeling in the world. So I am just kind of walking so high on this. Um, actually just closed out. Rachel says, right for the day, for the week, there won't be another one until next week. And it's so lovely to be writing. This happened on um, Monday session where I was just writing, 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 and my alarm went off on my phone and it's, you know, been more than a month. And I thought, why is my alarm set on my phone in the afternoon? What is going on? And I had forgotten that I was writing with people over in the zoom room, which is open. I'm just not in front of it. And it was such a lovely feeling to know that I wasn't alone, that I could flip my screen over back into Zoom, see, look at people's faces, see what they were doing. And that even though I was alone in my office, I wasn't alone in what I was doing. And boy, have I missed that. So that is delicious and wonderful and has been such a treat. It is raining today. I think we're in for a bit of rain coming and I'm enjoying the sound of it in my office. Um, really feeling at home, really expanding into home. All of the boxes are unpacked. The dog is currently settled under my desk and is being quiet. She has recently, uh, this week, learned that she can B-A-R-K. She's been going to doggy daycare where um, I think she has learned to B-A-R-K. I'm spelling it out because we She's very smart. She is a professor after all. And um, so that's not been the most fun. And we are always working with all the training and we're going to work on that now too, but she is a delight and she's under my desk right now. And it just feels so cozy in here. So I am thinking about coziness as I would like to thank some new patrons. And you know, I like to give these wishes for new patrons and I'd like to give a wish of some coziness. So to all my patrons, thank you, thank you, thank you for supporting me. I loved writing the Professor Junebug essay, which went out last week, which you could go look at for a dollar a month if you like, or just $1. Subscribe, read everything that's in there, and then unsubscribe. I, it 
you could absolutely do that. But to new patrons, I would like to thank Rose Edvilson. I wish for you that your next writing session makes you feel like you're flying through the clouds and that you're able to harness that flight again and again. To Susan Smith, I wish for you to find a sense of coziness the next time you sit down to write, the kind of coziness that your words will feel like warm blankets and that you will know inside that warmth exactly what you want to say and how to say it. And for Tara East, I wish for you the magic of unplanned, spontaneous time and for you to know in that moment exactly the best, most satisfying and fun way to spend it. And for Dan Heron, okay, dad, that's cute. Thank you. And I wish for you the luxury of a day you can spend reading all day, followed by a dinner of Lola's Chili Verde, which is the literal best. It might be up there in my top three foods of my life is Lola's Chili Verde. It is so good. Um, so thank you for that. All right, let's jump into the interview. I want to give you a little bit of a bio. Molly Fader is the award-winning author of more than 40 romance novels under the pen names Molly O'Keefe and M. O'Keefe. She grew up outside of Chicago and now lives in Toronto. The Sunshine Girls is her most recent novel. And here we go with the interview. Happy writing, my friends. I am so glad that you are here. I am so pleased to have you here today. Will you please share your name and pronouns with us? Yes, I'm Molly Fader slash Molly O'Keefe, and my pronouns are she, her. I am so happy to have you on the show talking about all things writing. Now that we have cleared up that we have met each other somewhere, we don't remember where, maybe it's going to come to us during this conversation. I already find you delightful, like an old friend that you probably are. <laughs> We were, we were trapped on that lifeboat. <laughs> we were, we were in that cave for 40, not something. You were something. going to name your firstborn after me, but then, yeah. Oh, thank goodness. Welcome. Welcome to my fifties. Okay. Let's talk about writing and books because honestly, I love writing. It holds my brain in place. And that is one of the things I love best about it. Let's talk to you about your writing process because you have written under different names. You have written a bunch of books. Um, how do you get it done? What does your writing process look like on a day-to-day -day basis? Gosh, you know, um, it's funny. I was thinking about th this podcast tonight and, and where I'm sort of at in, in my process right now and how it's changed. I have, like I've written over 50 novels. I've written mm -hmm. under three different pen names. Um, I've been doing this since I was like, as a job, I've been doing this since I was about 30. So it's, it's been like 17 years now and it's changed so much. And, and I'm at that, at that place in the process where, so I was incredibly busy. I released a book called the sunshine girls under the name Molly Fader at the beginning of December. So I, you know, I had all that promo for that. And then it was Christmas and now it's January 11th and I haven't written for like 40 like I'm going to say 50 days yeah. and it's like, I've never written <laughs> like today. I told my husband, I was like, today I'm, you know, like deadlines are starting They, you know, like I'm putting things in the book and, and today I sat down to write and I was like, what are words and in what order do they go? And it's like, it's like, I've never done this before. So that's not an answer to your question, but it's a very honest answer about where I love <laughs> the honest answer. What is the most, um, what, what part of writing, um, is easier for you? The, the first drafting or the revision? Oh, by a million miles. Like it's not even fair how much easier editing is for me. me too. I hate first draft. Really? The passion of a thousand sons. I, mean, I, 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 I don't like the imposter syndrome. Mm -hmm. I don't like, I am a believer in don't, you know, you, you don't get to write in a bunch of books if you're just constantly revising. So I'm like, leave like a shitty first draft, all of that yes. stuff. I believe in that, but it does not matter. At some point in the process, I'm like, this is garbage. Like every day is garbage. I'm waking up and I'm just a garbage creator. <laughs> like I, I am creating and moving garbage around on a page. And meanwhile, editing, I always feel like is like where the magic 
happens. Like that's where the fun stuff, where you realize that it, it's not entirely garbage and your subconscious was hard at work and you can see, you know, you can connect the dots that, that are there. That part, I could do that all day long, but I I'm, as I'm about to start, like, um, I have like, I have two projects. So Molly Fader, one of my pen names, writes um, like book club fiction, big sort of family saga mystery things. So I'm working on a proposal for that, which is like heavy brainstorming and like yeah, proposals, synopsis, that kind of yeah. the dreaded synopsis. And then the synopsis the dreaded, of lies never... because we're not going to write that book anyway. <laughs> They know that we know that, but we still have to produce it. Yeah. And you, and you like, as much as you want to write, like, Hey, we all know that this is going to be fine. Just trust me. You still have to somehow come up with an ending. (laughs) And then the other thing I have to do is like, start writing a romance and both of that, both of those things are awful. (laughs) I, I feel pain for you for absolutely. I'm in revision right now. So I'm like super, super happy and I don't ever want to leave it. So yes. And then when you are, so go on. I was going to say revising. I could revise for like hours, like like days and weeks. And like, that's when I like, I truly, truly want to get, sorry. I think that was a child or a dog. Hard to say. (laughs) Um, I like, I can just really burrow in. It's a dog. Okay, oh, come on. Yay. Um, but then at like writing, I'm like, you know, looking for a reason to stop and walk I'm the always, dog. Or I don't know how you feel about it, but I'm always wildly jealous, and I I don't think that'll ever change. About, uh, and I don't suffer much jealousy in anything else, but about the people who say, I you know, I can I can write about four to six thousand words a day every day. I'm like, what? I am good for. <laughs> I know because I did the math yesterday. How much this added up to? I'm good for three forty-five minute sprints when I am first drafting, and that is only two hours and fifteen minutes, and I'm toast. I'm done on a first draft. Whereas, like you revising, I can go eight hours if I'm on deadline. I can go twelve hours. I yeah. can do it. You know. You know, here's the thing I've got to say about the fast drafters. And I know that there are some real true fast drafters out there, but I think carpal tunnel syndrome, I think health issues comes for everybody, right? Like they, you, there, you can't, oh, maybe I'm wrong. I could be wrong, but there's, you're not writing four to 6,000 words a day for extended periods of time without doing incredible damage I to yourself. too. Yes. Yeah, if I yeah. were to and, do that, and, if I were to chain yeah. myself to the desk for those eight hours and write the whole time, typing the whole time, I, it w- I would be a wreck, a wreck. Yeah. And <laughs> I think burnout too. comes faster. I mean, I know that yeah. there are authors for whom that is not true. And I like they are, but they are the outliers. The yeah. rest of us, like you need to that breathing room in particular. I yes. think your body is, does, your brain does. What is your biggest challenge when it comes to writing? Besides first drafts. <laughs> yeah, all of it. <laughs> um, you know, I am an author who like f- for years, I, I don't, I don't get a lot of ideas, you know? So I, I get, I have, I'm, I'm a one idea at a time writer. And if it's a shitty idea, it's a shitty book. <laughs> like I, and, and, and sometimes I get the big lightning bolt ideas, but a lot of times I don't. And I, and I, if, I think as a, as a person who's looking at writers who are doing it indie and writers who are also like on the, you know, trad publishing path. Um, I just wish maybe like my biggest challenge would be that I could connect my ideas to bigger ideas and to marketable bigger marketing, you know, those big ideas, um, every once in a while you get them, but some, you know, it's just not how my brain works. Maybe I should try harder. It's probably, I I tried harder. (laughs) No, that's no, that is a fallacy. Cause I think you and I might be the same person in this. I have one (laughs) idea at a time, maybe two, and they're not always, most of the time, they're not the big blockbuster idea. What do they call the, the high concept? And sometimes I really have sat down on the couch and gone, okay, think of a high concept. Think of one, yeah. work on, you know, and I just, I am not an ideation gal. I, I wish, I wish I was, but I am a workaday gal. So that, that. Exactly. 
Exactly. Equals out. And, you know, like I, I have a friend in a, in a fairly intimate writing, you know, group of women so that, you know, we're, we're warts and all kind of friends and she's ideation. And it's like, I waffle between absolute, just jaw dropped astonishment and like, you're so pretty with these ideas. And then like wanting to throttle her. <laughs> I feel the same. Wanting her dead. Exactly. It must be so nice to just have ideas pouring out of you by the dozen when you wake up. What yeah, like is marketable? Like, marketable ideas. Yeah. Could make money on it right now. Yes. And they're like, oh, I'll have another one in the bath later today. Yeah. Do you want that one? You can have that one. You can have that one. Like I can give away my ideas. <laughs> I can't a career. To. Yeah, exactly. Oh my God, that's amazing. Exactly. What is your biggest joy when it comes to writing? Oh, I, I mean, I do. And I mean, you know, I'm 47 years old and I, and I have been doing it a while. So I don't know if I'm just leaning into this thing or it's brain chemistry, but it's, it, it's a thing that happened in editing. Now it's starting to happen in the brainstorming process where my subconscious, I just trust it a little bit more. Mm. And so, you know, those thorny problems, those, those, the things that maybe I would have said, oh, it's fine. You know, I'll go around this problem or something like that. I'll like, I'll sit on those problems and my subconscious will be working on it. And when those moments come, when the you know, the breakthrough comes or the big idea comes or the exciting idea comes, or you realize how you can connect those dots or you, re you know, all of those things, like there's no, it is the high I am chasing all the time <laughs> with writing, you know, yeah. like it really is the great, great time. And, and, you know, that coupled with, you know, those books resonating with readers and readers responding. I mean, there's no, there's no better thing. So I hear better I, than my kids. <laughs> I'm kidding. I and I hear what you're saying that that is you know you've learned to trust yourself. And do you think that there is a way? And I'm I'm asking because I don't I don't know if there is. Is there a way to learn to trust ourselves with that without just writing heaps of books? I I honestly don't think so. I mean, maybe some people like it's intuitive for them, yeah. but I, I just feel, and maybe again, it's just the, the position that I'm in and the experience that I've had, but there's so much of this craft and this business and this career that only happens with a lot of writing. I mean, I know a lot of people like put out their first book and it resonates with readers and it, you know, it goes gangbusters. I know that there are those outliers for sure. But for the most of us, you know, you got to write a couple of books before the one book hits, you know, before something really starts to work. And I, I think that's true all through the process. And I think that the the trust is built when we keep hitting those roadblocks that do stop a lot of people from finishing their first and second and third books. We have hit the roadblocks and we know that we'll never write again. We'll never fix this problem ever. And then our spouse tells us, oh, did you know this is what you always say? This is what you always say. And like, you know, 10 books in, it starts to be true. Oh yeah, you're right. I will do, I yeah. will figure this out. But that's not something we can just talk ourselves into. Or if it is, if listeners are saying, I talked myself into this trust, I would love to hear about it. Can yeah, you, I would too. Can you share a craft tip of any sort with us? you have gleaned? Oh, oh gosh. Um, yeah. Yeah. I have. I, <laughs> so one of the things that, um, that has become very, very true for me is, um, I, I don't necessarily believe in, in writer's block, but I believe very much that my subconscious is now trying to tell me something. Mm -hmm. So if, if for whatever reason, like I, and not right now, because I'm starting a book and I'm looking for reasons not to start a book, but you know, when I'm in the middle of it and things are working, but, and, but suddenly it grinds to a halt and like days go by where I can't make things happen. Um, that is all, always, always, always my subconscious telling me that I need to back up mm -hmm. and see what I've done wrong. However, if that is still not the case, I go to the, the last place where I've started to struggle and I change tense. 
So Ooh. if I'm writing in third person, I write in first person. If I'm writing in past, I try to write in present. If I'm writing a, like the single POV of the heroine, I like throw in it here. It, like it is not necessarily going to stay there, right. but oftentimes the thing that needs to, you know, the, the, the climbing up over the hurdle or whatever it is, is usually done, but you've got to get dramatically out of you know, write, write the point of view, you know, write the scene in the point of view of the, of the character, you know, who's just watching or something like that, like a right. true real writing exercise, not going to be a part of the book, right. but I find that that often helps. I have heard so many writing tips on the show and no one has ever said anything even close to that. And I love it. And I'm going to steal it for my next first draft. When I get Please do. stuck, <laughs> you go back to the place where you were feeling comfortable right before it all went wrong. Mm -hmm. And you just do something wild. Yeah. That's so cool. I, uh, for one second, I wished I was in first drafting and then I thought better of it. Nope. Nope. Don't want to yeah. be there. <laughs> I mean, I, I am getting better at first you know, drafting, I'm, but you know, ugh. I'm not a writer who like, you know, the, do, do you journal or anything in the morning? I do. Like there are people I do. up and do, oh, you do. Yeah. See, I'm always like, man, I, I can't like the the word count is so precious. I'm like, I can't waste it. So it like, it took me a while to get to this place where I was like, I'm going to write some shit. I'm going to throw away. Yes. And, but man, does it ever help? Does it ever yeah. help? Yeah. The one thing that does help me is I do, I, I do my morning pages, which is just basically word vomit about my own emotions. It's the, literally the most boring thing ever. But in the, in the manuscript itself, usually I work at Scrivener and, and I normally have a, a something, a little scene file that I just call journal. And it's when I'm stuck. I just, start babbling to myself about why I could get stuck or like what would help and what kind of what flavor ice cream would help. And every once in a while I'll slip into a little bit of dialogue that I'm playing with. And suddenly I've tricked myself into having an idea. Yeah. So it is, it is all about that. As my friend, uh, Mona McDermott says, um, that love tricking that we do to ourselves. Yeah. Pulling the love tricks. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and I, you know, like when we're drafting, I feel like particularly when we're drafting and you get that kind of tunnel vision, yeah. you know, when you start a book and you're like, I'm going to, these are the themes and this is the world <laughs> and this is how it's all. I actually know an the, ending. Yeah. Yeah. Right. I've got like the whole vision and then you start going and you're just like, I'm just saying the same words over and over again. They're feeling the same things over and over again. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. They're all nodding you and know, tilting their heads. Yeah. <laughs> there is an author who wrote a book a few years ago, his name is Jess Waller. And he wrote beautiful ruins. I'm looking at my bookshelf over there and it's a beautiful book. It's a, it's a, it's, I highly recommend it. It's a great book, but he has a different notebook for every book. So he writes the book, but as he's writing the book, he's writing about like, like kind of like a diary kind of, I love that. A, a vision. I know, I know. And I never do it. I've never got it together <laughs> to remember that because I have thought of that before. I just thought yeah. it'd be a beautiful idea to have this collection of books, kind of like Twyla Tharp's boxes. You know, how she has a box for every dance or choreography project that she's ever done. Um, but yeah, I don't, I don't have that. I just have a, a cluster of, of crappy Scrivener files. <laughs> That's right. And, and probably 7,000 unused notebooks <laughs> just waiting. Exactly. Exactly. Oh my God. I love that. What is the kindest thing that anyone's ever done for you in your writing career? Oh gosh. Um, man. Okay. So when I started writing, I sold a book. I sold to Harlequin. So I was like, I wrote, I wrote for Harlequin for many years. And at the beginning, I wrote for a couple of different lines that all sort of sh shut down as soon as I got involved. But um, <laughs> in one of those situations, um, I was bought by an editor and then that editor left. And so I was handed off to a new editor and that editor's name was Susan Pezik. And she, I still have this letter. She'd gotten my, my manuscript and she basically, like, I didn't understand point of view. I didn't understand how to start and stop a scene. Like, and she, she took several, like, I'm going to say 26 pages to basically teach me with great patience, how to write the mechanics of writing. Oh, you know, so she'd got, I cannot even imagine what her life would have been like. She got this manuscript. She'd been like, 
she's in like third person. She's in first person. She's like omniscient. She's like, she's all over the place. And, you know, however I got that contract, I have no idea, but um, yeah, she took the time to, to do that instead of um, either editing me and edit. And you, you know what I mean? Instead just of just fixing it, like right? doing it all and ed- yeah, instead of just yeah. fixing it or even, you know, pushing me off the schedule so much that I would never have been published. Right. Like, so I would have kept my, my little bit of money that I'd gotten in as an advance, but you know, we'd heard of that sort of thing yeah. happen, but she really, really took the time. And then, you know, she went her way in Harlequin and I left Harlequin. So we kind of went our separate ways, but now, um, under the name Molly Fader, I'm writing these big book club books. She's my, she bought me for the, no <laughs> she, way. She my editor, but yeah. Yeah, she, she, I then she handed me off to like the date, you know, the dated, the fix up her grammar kind of editor. But um, yeah, she was the one who bought me. Isn't that funny? That's Small, like full circle. Gorgeous. May Chen at HarperCollins Avon um, bought my first three books. And then, you know, my first book was accidentally good. And my second book was just the biggest, hottest mess. And she did something similar with me where she just really broke it down to me that I, did not understand story structure. Like I'd never, I had an MFA and I'd never heard of story structure. And my dream is one day to work for her again, because number one, she's amazing and kind and so generous. And number two, I just want to blow her socks off with a good book. Right. <laughs> On the just show time. her that you, that you heard and listened and you've been like applying. I have actually yeah. sent her at least one thank you card over the years, just thanking her for that opportunity that she didn't fire me. Cause she could have, she could have just said, all right, never mind. You keep that money. It wasn't that much, you know? So yeah. You know, it is, it is such a, for, for new authors. And I I think like you, you know, I, I've signed up to help mentor, you know, I'm always offering to judge contests. Like I, I, I appreciate the fact that it's very hard to get kind feedback in this business, right. You know, like, and, and, and helpful, right. Like, um, constructive and kind feedback. And yeah, because I think I got that, I am, I am incredibly committed. Yeah. Trying to help other people get it too. And now editors are so busy. Yeah. Now they literally just don't have time. They really, they they really don't. I feel so badly for them. Um, speaking of kind things, what is the kindest thing that you've ever done for yourself as a writer? I love watching your face. <laughs> huh. I mean, like, you, but I mean, just like every day, you know, I'm going to tell you, actually, I'm going to tell you, like, there've been a couple of times I was going to say, I was going to say like every day, just like quiet, quiet patience and forgiveness. It's okay, buddy. You know, it's okay. Oh. You tried your best, but actually <laughs> I think the truth is that I didn't give up. You know, like if you're in this business long enough, you get, you get, you're going to hit a wall. You're going to jump off the cliff. Like things are going to go catastrophically wrong. And a lot of people could leave and would not be blamed for leaving and trying something else and moving on. I mean, this is an industry that, that chews up the mid list in a way that like is unbelievable. And I think the, the kindest thing I've ever done is stayed humble to the craft and just kept going like stubbornly, like a, like a very old dog that can't see, (laughs) keeps trying to get through the door. And, and I, you know, like I, you, you know, every, it's hard to see some of the highlights you know, in the day to day or whatever, but when you start to collect, you know, some successes, you're like, thanks past me for not giving up. Yeah. Cause we wouldn't have gotten here. That's beautiful. And good job, buddy. <laughs> good job, buddy. Yeah. That's really, Way to go. really love it. Yeah, Way to go. Oh, thank you for that, Molly. What is the best book that you have read recently? And why did you love it? That I've read recently? Mm-hmm. Um, so I, so I'll, I'll do two because I'm a huge, I'm a huge romance fan and, you know, moving into book club fiction, my latest and greatest obsession is Kate C. Wells. 
If you have not read Kate C. I Wells, have not. She writes, oh my Lord. Oh my Lord. Kate C. Wells started writing like motorcycle romance fiction. And these books were dark and honest and gritty and funny and compelling. And every character was three-dimensional and nuanced and like, just like, I, it felt like my jaw dropped reading them. And then she started to write some sort of small town romances that were, that were a you know, kind of an offshoot and they also the same. And then she was writing like mafia stuff and like real and true psychopaths. And I was like, it's Kate, is there anything you can't do? And then she started writing um, rejected mate werewolf shifters or not werewolf, just wolf shifters, which is a thing that I would never have said I would have read. But Kate C. Wells led me there and I will go wherever she wants. Her, her romances are top notch, like A plus in my eyes. And then the other great book that I've read recently is called um, When We Lost Our Heads. And it's written by a Canadian author called Heather O'Neill. And Heather O'Neill, she's French Canadian. And I, like, you, you don't quite know the nuances of that until you're in Canada, but like, there's just a level of like, both quirkiness and vulnerability and disdain. And like, there's just something about her voice and that French Canadian experience that's, that is also very gritty and, but she writes about female friendships. So it's like takes place during the turn of the century in Montreal, like turn of the 19th yeah. into the 18th, 1800s, 1900s. Yeah. And about two girls from very different lives who become very good friends and they are toxic and they are, are disasters and they're in love in the way of friends. Like it is, it, but it's just, it's, it's a beautiful book. So anything by Kate C. Wells, anything by Heather O'Neill, but recently her, When Thank We Lost you. Our Heads. Going right to the top of my TBR. I love asking this question. Speaking of amazing books, can you please speak about your most recent book by your name, Molly Fader, which is The Sunshine Girls. Will you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah. So the Sunshine Girls started in, a, again, it was the, my subconscious taking care of me. Is it the, the opening scene came to me in a dream Wow. where it, yeah, like fully like music scored. It was insane. Um, I sometimes, because I'm a woman of a certain age, I have to take a little weed drop to go to bed. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. 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 Really. <laughs> so anyway, in so many so ways. Yes. The, yeah. Yeah. Really, <laughs> really. Um, but the book starts with two very strange sisters who are burying their mother in small town, Iowa. And into this funeral walks Kitty Devereaux, who's like stage and screen beauty icon. And she walks in and she's like, yeah, you guys didn't know, don't know who your mother is. And then I woke up from that dream and I was like, oh my God, who is their mom? Who is their mom? <laughs> <laughs> and, and I started, you know, you start you know, when you get that big idea, you start peppering questions like how, where, who, and all those things and, and to, to build out the idea. And so from there, my mom was a nurse in the, in nurses, nursing school in the 1960s in Iowa. And I was like, and she talks a lot about coming from a very small town in Iowa, coming from a farm town in Iowa, like what it was like to to have roommates and to like how her world kind of grew. And I thought, man, what if they met as nursing school? Cause in the sixties, you know, there, there were not a lot of choices for women in efforts to get, you know, economic independence, yeah. teaching and nursing were kind of it or typists if secretarial mm -hmm. school, if you lived in a city. Um, so yeah. So, so from the, the, Hollywood icon, I sort of started to build into some, a lot of my mom stories. Mm. So this book is like a bit of a love letter to nurses. It's a love letter to my mom. It's, it's got some Hollywood glamour. It takes place. Like part of it takes place during Vietnam. It's a very sweeping saga with at the heart of it, these very different women who find a kind of friendship that just changes their lives. Yeah. Catnip. Catnip. That is all. Yeah. It, 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 it was a gift kind of book. It was really fun. It was yeah. fun to write. It was a dare to write, but it was fun. It was, it was one of those books that challenged me and like made me a better writer. Oh, I love that. Where can we find you online? So you can find me at molly-okeefe.com. Um, 
you can find me at, I'm on Instagram as M O'Keefe author, and you can find me on TikTok. Same kind of stuff. You can find me on Facebook. Oh my God. My dog's heavy sign over there. Uh, yeah, so all the usual places, Mo- but it's it's all under Molly O'Keefe. But come Molly, find it has me, been please. such a treat to talk to you, my brand new and very old friend, perhaps. Um, <laughs> it's just been a delight. Thank you so much for being here today. My pleasure. Thank you for having me.